Chapter 10. Conley Enters Case While the grand jury was considering the indictment of Frank, a new figure entered the case. The man in question was James Conley, a negro sweeper at the National Pencil Factory, who from that time, through the tedious trial which was to follow, was the dominant figure about which the state built its case, and the man to whom the crime itself was to be charged by the defense of Frank. Conley had been arrested while the coroner's inquest was in progress. E. F. Holloway, timekeeper at the factory, one afternoon about one o'clock saw Conley washing a shirt. He said nothing to the Negro, but quietly called for the detectives. When the police arrived some ten minutes later, Conley had dried the shirt partially and had the garment still damp on his back. Come with me, said the policeman. "'Boss, I haven't done a thing,' said the negro. "'Why, you brute,' answered the officer. "'You were seen washing Mary Fagin's blood off the shirt you now have on.' "'Boss, that wasn't blood. It was just natural nigger dirt,' said Conley. "'Well, why were you washing it at this time of day?' questioned the blue coat. "'Well, days done called me for a witness at the court. And "'I didn't want to go around all those white people in a dirty shirt,' Jim said." and the officer believed him, because every employee of the factory had been ordered that day to report before the coroner. But Jim was a negro, and the police couldn't afford to take chances, so they locked him up and forgot about him for several weeks. Detective Harry Scott dropped in Jim's cell one day and asked the negro to write a few sentences for him. The detectives were working then, as they were throughout the case, on the handwriting clue. "'Boss, I can't write a word,' innocently responded the negro, as he walked closer to the bars and begged the officer for a cigarette. Replying to Scott's questions, the negro gave a glib account of his movements on the Saturday of the tragedy, accounting for every minute and swearing that he had never been near the factory on that day. Nothing was thought of Jim Conley for a week or more, and then factory employees on the occasion of the many visits of the detectives to the scene of the tragedy informed that Conley bore a bad reputation, that he had been in the hands of the police repeatedly, and that once he had been in the city stockade and worked on the streets in front of the factory. The detectives paid little attention to the statements of the factory people about the Negro at first, as they were so certain that he had had nothing at all to do with the crime. And in addition, they found that Conley was not well liked because he had borrowed money from many employees and had failed to pay it back. Things dragged along until a few days before the case against Frank was to be presented to the grand jury, and all of the sleuths were at a loss for new clues. One day Scott casually asked a young clerk at the factory if Conley could write. The answer was yes, and searching through a desk, he found a contract to pay the installments on a watch which Jim had signed. Realizing that Conley had lied about one particular, the detective thought it highly probable that his story was a lie from start to finish. They started giving him the third degree, that third degree which was to later cause so much comment at the trial. On May 23rd, Conley admitted under the third degree that he had lied about not knowing how to write, but swore that he knew nothing about the crime. He gave the officers a specimen of his handwriting, and they were startled by its similarity to that found on the notes by the slain girl's body. Saturday morning about ten o'clock, however, Conley sent for Detective John Black. "'Boss, I's going to tell you the whole truth now,' he said. I did write them notes that you accused me of writing, but I did it because Mr. Frank told me to, and he said he was going to send them to his mother in Brooklyn and that she would give me a job. Go ahead, said the elated detective, and tell me all about it, Jim. Don't keep back a thing. Well, Friday morning, about three o'clock, Mr. Frank comes to me and says, Hold on, Jim, you mean Saturday, interrupted the officer. "'No, sir, Friday,' said Jim. "'Go ahead,' returned Black, anxious to get as much of the story as possible at that time, 
and knowing that he could work on the obvious lies later. But the Negro had practically told his story for the day. He added many details, declaring that Frank gave him two dollars and fifty cents, which was in a cigarette box when he had written the notes, and offered to get him a job with wealthy relatives in Brooklyn. Black called Harry Scott in, and after they had written out the Negro's statement and had it signed, they rushed to the solicitor's office. The grand jury was then in session, considering the indictment of Frank. Scott and Black wanted to clinch the indictment by putting Jim Connolly before the grand jury and allowing that body to hear his story. Dorsey, however, confident that there was enough evidence without the Negro to secure Frank's indictment, and wishing to keep the Negro's story a secret, refused to put him on the witness stand. His effort to keep the sensation a secret was futile, however, and before the grand jury adjourned, an extra journal announced the startling news. Still, Dorsey held that he could get an indictment of Frank without the Negro's story, and within a few hours it was known that he was right. That afternoon, Dorsey had a long conference with the Negro and the detectives, and a stenographic report of the conversation was made. Conley stuck to his story. Conley stuck to his story, although the detectives pointed out that his story wouldn't fit, and told him that it showed premeditation on the part of Frank, and that there could be no premeditation where such a crime is involved. Conley swore repeatedly that he was telling the whole truth, and the detectives then thought that he would never change his story. Here's the way Conley told his story in the first affidavit. State of Georgia, County of Fulton. Personally appeared before the undersigned, a notary public, in and for the above state and county, James Conley, who, being sworn on oath, says, On Friday evening before the holiday, about four minutes to one o'clock, Mr. Frank come up the aisle and asked me to come to his office. That was the aisle on the fourth floor where I was working. When I went down to the office, he asked me, could I write? And when I told him, yes, I could write a little bit. And he gave me a scratch pad and told me what to put on it. And told me to put on there, dear mother, a long, tall, black negro did this by himself. And he told me to write it two or three times on there. I wrote it on a white scratch pad, a brown-looking scratch pad, and looked at my writing, and wrote on that himself. But when I went to his office, he asked me if I wanted a cigarette, and I told him yes, but they didn't allow any smoking in the factory. And he pulled out a box of cigarettes that cost 15 cents a box, and in that box he had two dollars and fifty cents, two paper dollars and two quarters, and I'd taken one of the cigarettes and handed him the box back, and he told me that that was all right, I was welcome to that, for I was a good working negro around there. And then he asked me where was Gordon Bailey. Snowball, they call him. And I told him he was on the elevator. And he asked me if I know the night watchman. And I told him, no, sir, I didn't know him. And he asked me if I ever saw him in the basement. And I told him, no, sir, I never did see him down there. But he could ask the fireman, and maybe he could tell him more about that than I could. And then Mr. Frank was laughing and jolly and going on in the office. And I asked him not to take out any money for that watchman I, I owed, for I didn't have any to spare. And he told me he wouldn't, but he would see to me getting some money a little bit later. He told me he had some wealthy people in Brooklyn, and then he held his head up and looked out of the corner of his eyes and said, Why should I hang? And that's all I remember him saying to me. When I asked him not to take out money for the watch, he said, you ought not to buy any watch, for that wife of mine wants me to buy her an automobile. But he wouldn't do it. I never did see his wife. On Tuesday morning, after the holiday on Saturday, before Mr. Frank got in jail, he come up the aisle where I was sweeping, and held his head over to me and whispered to me to be a good boy. And that was all he said to me. Signed, James Conley. Sworn to and subscribed before me this 24th day of May, 1913, G.C. February.
Notary Public, Fulton County, Georgia. The detectives were highly elated, however, as they knew that they had in custody the writer of the murder notes. Lie out of whole cloth as they thought his story might be, they were absolutely certain that his hand penned the notes. Handwriting experts had testified that in their opinion the writing on the notes was that of Newt Lee. But it didn't take an expert to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jim Conley wrote, once they had a sample of his hand and a sample of the murder notes before them. Detectives and students of the crime generally had repeatedly declared that the hand that wrote the notes tied the cord around Mary Fagan's neck. But the sleuths were still unsatisfied when they found out that for weeks they had had the writer of the notes in custody. The mystery was clearing, but it was not solved. Conley was clearly the missing link in the chain, they said. No one believed that he was telling the whole truth. The story that Frank had the notes written on Friday, planning the crime, simply couldn't be swallowed. The suspicion that Conley himself might be the murderer became stronger every hour, and there was some talk about the saloons of a lynching bee. The detectives went after Conley again. The Negro was up against the third degree in earnest.